We all know what characters are. They're the little crazy human-like avatars that move around in our little literary simulations. And you'd be hard to press to find successful stories that don't have at least one fully-fledged character, although such stories exist. Characters get talked about a lot by writers. Too much, in my opinion. At least when compared to plot, narration, story, world, text, and subtext. And, not surprisingly, when most writers talk about characters, they don't do so in a very specific way, or at least in any specific helpful way. I recently wrote an essay about the popular TV show Game of Thrones, and while I was researching, I listened to a few interviews with George R.R. R. Martin, the author of the novels on which the series is based. He was asked why he thought the show was so memorable. Hopefully it's because of the characters, he responded. Martin, like most writers out there, wants to write great characters, and he seems to have succeeded if the popularity of the show is any indication. But how do we do that? First, I'd say this. Characters, as most writers think of them, are not the end-all be-all of fiction. I'm in the minority with this position, so before you recoil in horror, indulge me for a bit while I explain. I started these lessons with plot and moved on to narration, but you're probably aware that you can't have a plot without a narrator, and that narrator needs to have a decent plot to convey or all points become moot. We're working our way through the six critical elements of written fiction I outlined at the outset. The plot, the narrator, the characters, the story world, the text, and the subtext. Each of these story elements depends on the others for their existence. One of the writers I referenced in the last chapter, Daniel Orozco, has a great metaphor for the process we're working our way through. He describes pulling a story apart a bit like a doctor doing an autopsy. All the systems of a story just like the human body, are codependent. If the lungs don't feed oxygen to the brain, the brain won't tell the heart to beat, and if the heart doesn't beat, muscles turn into meat, and bones become a heap of calcified sticks. You get the idea. Similarly, only the process of reading a story animates it. And while reading, you cannot extract plot from character, from setting, from narration. It all must work together in the same way you can't remove the cardiovascular system of a living person and have any reasonable expectation of life. Yet doctors have, over thousands of years, performed surgeries and autopsies and figured out how various systems of the body work together. In the Game of Thrones essay I referenced earlier, I gave the example of Ned Stark as a character. Ned is, in my opinion, a pretty boring character in terms of who he would be as a person if you met him. He's a stern, do-things-by-the-book person, He's a nobleman, so he has a lot of power and responsibility, which he takes very seriously. And power, as we've discussed, is interesting, especially to the people over whom that power governs. But at home, in his own castle, carefully overseeing the stable hierarchy Ned is charged with maintaining? Well, frankly, Ned Stark is boring. However, Ned spends very little time in his own castle in the story because soon after the reader meets Ned, the king arrives and asks him to run the kingdom as his right-hand man. Then Martin cleverly has Ned play the role of the only honest man in a capital city full of liars, tricksters, and betrayers, all looking to undercut Ned's authority. How he behaves in that environment is what makes Ned Stark an interesting character. Nobody would read the story of Ned's stable 20-year marriage while he peacefully governs his own house and territory. Ned has a bunch of kids, and everyone's happy. Good for Ned, not so much for the reader. So what can we gather about writing characters from Ned's case? First, that almost any type of person can turn into a good character, but that character is only going to be interesting as a product of both their inherent traits and the situation they find themselves in. It's a bit like life in that way. We're all a product of both nature and nurture simultaneously. So how do we write good characters? First, by having a clear idea of who each character is. Second, by putting that character into interesting situations. Then, when the character acts, or doesn't act according to his or her or its own instincts, the reaction will be believable and captivating to the reader. That's the very short answer. I'm sure you're betting that Roe has a lot more to say about this than that, though. And you're right.
These lessons are an exercise in reductive thinking, which too often in intellectual circles has a negative connotation to it. If you hear someone call something a reductionist argument, it's usually not to compliment the speaker of that argument. But complex systems must be reduced to be understood, and stories, are they ever complex? So we're going to get just as reductive with characters as we have been with plot and narration, and we're going to approach them from several different angles. By the end, we'll have a far greater general understanding of characters. If the narrator is the nervous system and the plot the musculoskeletal system of a story, the characters are the heart, the lungs, and the blood coursing through its veins. Let's poke around and get our hands bloody, people. Characters, characters, characters. Readers form an understanding of characters in multiple ways. Some of what they know about characters will come directly from the way the narrator describes the character. Explicit knowledge. Here's Norman MacLean again. My father was very certain about certain matters pertaining to the universe. To him, all good things, trout as well as salvation, come by grace, and grace comes by art, and art does not come easy. This is Norman's narrator telling the reader something specific about his father's character directly. It's not quite as straightforward as he was six foot two, heavy set, and had tightly cropped graying hair that had once been as black as coal, but it does give you direct information about his father's sense of certainty about the world. When writers and readers think about characters, it's common for them to start here with explicit information, as so many authors do when writing a story. It's far more common to see an explicit description of a character like this at the start of the story than at the end of it. But it's important to remember that though this may be an important part of the body of knowledge a reader compiles about a character, it's the smallest part. By the end of A River Runs Through It, the reader has come to understand Norman's father through the prism of the certainty Norman describes here, yes. But so much more of what the reader knows about his father comes through other sources his father's actions, what his father says, and how Norman reacts to each. This aspect of characters is often underappreciated and technically has just as much to do with plot as it does with character. Look at this tangle of thorns, as Humbert would say. Let's probe a little deeper. Here's Norman's father talking about Norman's brother Paul, who works as a newspaper reporter. Haven't you heard, he asked me? that he has changed the spelling of our name from McLean to McLean. Now he spells it with a capital L. Oh, sure, I said. I knew all about that. He told me he got tired of nobody spelling his name right. My father shook his head at my explanation. It's truth being irrelevant. He murmured both to himself and to me. It's a terrible thing to spell our name with a capital L. Now somebody will think we're Scottish lowlanders and not islanders. This conversation, as much as any description of Norman's father, is instructive of who Norman's father is. It speaks of a generational gap between the immigrant father who clings to his heritage as a vital part of his identity, and the American son whose identity is Montana boy, outdoorsman, fly fisherman. Paul doesn't give a damn about a capital L. But the dialogue here tells the reader their father is somewhat bothered by the change, and he's bothered by the cavalier way Paul discards the formalities he considers important. And it tells us so much more. It would take me perhaps a thousand words at least to untangle the implications of this single exchange. This is characterization as much as any explicit description could be. It helps the reader to form their understanding of who that character is. So much of what fiction is exists in these unwritten implications. It's one of the things that makes narrative so resistant to objective analysis. Okay, so let's get as reductive and specific as we can be with this, so we can be certain of what we're talking about here. Check out this brief passage I've cribbed from Maggie Shipstead's short story, The Cowboy Tango. 
Here, the protagonist, Sammy, is considering an ad in the Bozeman paper posted by a horse rancher who is looking to hire a wrangler. This is explicit characterization. She was 16 and so skinny that the whole of her beanpole body fit neatly inside the circle of shade cast by her hat. Implicit characterization looks like this brief passage cribbed from a couple paragraphs later in the same story, after the rancher asks her to ride a particularly difficult horse of his. Sammy jerked the reins up, but not meanly, and kicked the mare through the gate into the home paddock. In five minutes, she had her going around like a show pony. If we were to sum up both of these passages in a single statement, it might be something like, super skinny girl, great at riding horses. But there's more there, too. She's unafraid, and she cares about animals. She's only as tough as she needs to be to get the job done. She's competent, bold. The underlying knowledge that is a product of the reader interpreting Sammy's actions here presents the reader with an excellent knowledge base for this character. This is also why the axiom show don't tell often represents a powerful truth for writers, even if it isn't always a perfect metaphor. A character in action, demonstrating who they are, is usually going to be more complete and more interesting than a narrator describing the same aspects of that character's personality. Implicit knowledge about the character is the sum of all the assumptions the reader will make about the character based on their thoughts, actions, etc. A complete study of this aspect of characterization is likely vaster and more complex than the study of plot itself. This is perhaps a subject all its own for another narrative theorist with a different purpose than ours. I suppose I could sum it up for the time being by saying, it's critical to have a handle on what your character's thoughts and actions mean. We'll get deeper into the implicit shortly, but for now we'll continue with the easy part, the explicit. Explicit character descriptions are far easier to assess reductively. They're often presented as non-narrative elements on their own. Let's take a look at a couple ways to get this done. Here is the great Gabriel Garcia Marquez describing the handsomest drowned man in the world. Not only was he the tallest, strongest, most virile, and best equipped man they had ever seen, but as they watched him, he didn't even fit in their imaginations. They couldn't find a big enough bed in the village to lay him on, nor a table solid enough to hold vigil. The festival pants of the tallest men didn't fit him, nor did the Sunday shirts of the fattest, nor the shoes of the best planted. This is simple, straight description. The reader learns from this description that the drowned man is a paragon of masculinity. He's big, strong, virile, and almost impossibly so. These are things that can be observed, and in some cases measured and compared. This is one type of straight description, the concrete. Here's another type of description from the same story. They thought that he would have had such authority that he could have taken the fish from the sea by only calling them by name, and he would have put such effort in his work that he would have brought forth springs from between the driest rocks and would have been able to sow flowers on the cliffs. These descriptive elements are similarly hyperbolic, but immeasurable. The villagers are reacting to their impressions of the man. This is abstract description. You can't count it, touch it, or prove one way or the other that these things are so, but they're still descriptive elements that color the reader's impression of the character. Straight description can be abstract or concrete, often in the same story. It's important to note that description of a character doesn't always need to be done in non-narrative ways, that is, with sentences that describe the character's state of being. Here's an example of what I mean from two stories with similar titles that approach description in different ways. She was a bone-thin woman with a pretty face, dark eyes and brown hair that hung down her back. She liked necklaces made of turquoise and long pendant earrings. This is the narrator in Raymond Carver's short story, What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. Note how this narrator uses linking verbs to describe the female character's state of being. She was. She liked. This was a famous short story as short stories go. So famous, in fact, that it inspired the story from which I'm drawing the ensuing excerpt. In this passage, a middle-aged husband is describing a visit from his wife's friends, two Orthodox Jews from Israel. You want some water, I offer? Coke in the can? You which of us, Mark says. You both, I say. Or I've got whiskey. Whiskey's kosher too, right? If it's not, I'll kosher it up real fast, he says. 
pretending to be easygoing. And right then he takes off that big black hat and plops down on the couch in the den. This is from Nathan Englander's short story, What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank, published about 25 years after the Carver story that inspired it. Note that unlike Carver's narrator, Englander's narrator doesn't set aside a specific sentence to describe this character's hat the way Carver did with the woman's jewelry. In fact, the narrator doesn't mention that the man is wearing a hat at all until this moment, and he puts it into motion. He takes off that big black hat and plops down on the couch in the den. Englander uses an action verb to take a descriptive element, the hat, and make it part of the living character. Englander does this a lot, and he's very good at it. This is description in motion, an excellent and vivid way to kill two birds with one stone. Okay, so we can describe in the abstract and in the concrete, and we can describe a state of being by either pausing the story with linking verbs or setting descriptive elements in motion, as Englander did above. This, as I mentioned earlier, is the easy part of building a character, the explicit elements. Description. What can we say about the tough stuff, all those intangible, implicit things? Characterization. I'm going to mention three examples emblematic of common ways characters are characterized by plot elements in the story world. This is barely to scratch the surface, and is by no means even a sufficient start to the conversation. It's merely here to point out three common different ways characters are characterized in fiction. Way the first. A character's behavior shapes the way a reader or audience understands the character. One of my favorite examples of this is from an iconic scene at the start of David Lean's timeless classic Lawrence of Arabia. The following is my description of the scene as it appears in the film. It goes something like this. Lawrence and two enlisted men are in a dank, nondescript room. After reading about significant developments in the war from his newspaper, Lawrence offers to light the sergeant's cigarette. Once lit, Lawrence puts out the burning match by slowly closing his thumb and forefinger over the flame, while the sergeant and corporal look on intently. You'll do that once too often, the sergeant says. It's only flesh and bone. Michael George Hartley. Lawrence says, smiling. You're a philosopher. And you're balmy, the corporal says. As Lawrence picks up his hat to exit the room, the corporal lights a match and proceeds to put it out in the same manner as Lawrence. Ooh, it damn well hurts, he says. Certainly it hurts, Lawrence says as he walks towards the door. Well, what's the trick then? The corporal asks. Lawrence turns to face the corporal and says with a grin, The trick, William Potter, is not minding that it hurts. Lawrence's behavior in this exchange says a lot about him, and it says a lot of important things that characterize him in ways that will be significant throughout the film. It shows a viewer, implicitly, that Lawrence is an uncommon man in more ways than one. Viewing the scene without the time to analyze it properly only leaves the reader with the sense that Lawrence seems like an odd duck. But if we go back and look carefully at the scene, a few important points jump out as significant. Lawrence addresses the enlisted men using their full names, which is strange. It has a way of distancing Lawrence from them. And the trick with the match shows that he doesn't mind discomfort. In fact, he seems to enjoy that he can separate himself even further from these men by demonstrating his indifference to the pain. Lawrence has a bit of a messianic complex, something that will shape his journey. The scene, apart from being superbly written, acted, and shot, is subtly prophetic. They'd call this foreshadowing in English class. The ordinary men in the room react as ordinary men do, by being rightly averse to pain and stating certainly, you'll do that once too often. Lawrence walks out wearing a smug smile, a staggeringly brilliant scene that characterizes the character through his own behavior. The next way stories implicitly characterize characters is through interactions with their environment. In other words, context characterizes characters. In the primer to this section, I mentioned that Ned Stark is an entirely different character when he's taken out of his own castle, where he's comfortable, and placed into an entirely different environment where he doesn't have command of the situation. This is true of most characters. Again, Lawrence is a good example, too. He turns himself into a folk hero among the Arabs by planning and commanding the sacking of Aqaba proposing to Sheriff Ali that they cross the Nafud Desert on camels and surprise the Turks on the other side, 
because the Turks would never expect an assault from the land. Ali thinks this is mad, because in his words, the Nefud is the worst place God created. Along the way, one of the men calls it the Sun's Anvil. The Arabs doubt Lawrence because they believe it to be almost suicidal and blasphemous to attempt such a feat. Yet when they succeed, largely because of the determination Lawrence inspires in everyone, at least as the story has it, Lawrence becomes a living legend among them. This would never have happened to Lawrence in the English countryside. One gets the impression that Lawrence was the type of man who surely would have found some other way to test his mettle against the relentlessness of nature, whether it be the sea, the mountains, or the cold. But in the absence of such context to test a character, the viewer wouldn't understand Lawrence in the same way they do when he emerges dramatically from the desert and declares in defiance of the Nefud and the Arab's folk wisdom that nothing is written. This character-shaping environment needn't be a landscape either. It might be the collection of people that surrounds the character. A reader would get an entirely different impression of your character if they were to walk through a cattle auction than if they were to walk through a fashion show. They also might think entirely differently about a character at a party in the penthouse of a luxury hotel than a character laid up with a few dirty scoundrels in a seedy motel. Context has a way of telling your readers something about your characters, even if it isn't always easy to articulate. Context characterizes characters. Lastly, other characters and their actions characterize characters as well. Speaking of dirty scoundrels, my favorite example of character-on-character character characterization comes from the first chapter of Robert Louis Stevenson's pirate adventure, Treasure Island. Through the first three quarters of the opening chapter, Jim, the young boy narrating the tale, spends much of the story describing a visitor to his family's inn. This guest is a pirate, and a rude, blustery, bullying drunk of a pirate at that. He spends much of his time bossing people around, upsetting guests with his loud singing, and scaring everyone with frightening stories from his many years at sea. In short, he's not a very nice fellow. Then, toward the end of the chapter, Dr. Livesey comes to care for Jim's father when he becomes deathly ill. Jim offers a very brief description of the doctor. I remember observing the contrast of the neat, bright doctor with his powder as white as snow and his bright black eyes and pleasant manners, made with the cultish country folk, and above all with that filthy, heavy, bleared scarecrow of a pirate of ours. And damned if this isn't doubly clever, because Stevenson is training the reader to do just this, contrast these two men, first in their appearance and then in their manner. Go to work again, Robert. In the meantime, the captain gradually brightened up at his own music and at last flapped his hand on the table before him in a way we all knew to mean silence. The voices stopped at once, all but Dr. Livesey's. He went on as before, speaking clear and kind and drawing briskly at his pipe between every word or two. The captain glared at him for a while, flapped his hand again, glared still harder, and at last broke out with a villainous low oath, Silence there between decks! Were you addressing me, sir? says the doctor. And when the ruffian had told him, with another oath, that this was so, I have only one thing to say to you, sir, replies the doctor that if you keep on drinking rum, the world will be soon quit of a very dirty scoundrel. The old fellow's fury was awful. He sprang to his feet, drew and opened a sailor's clasp knife, and balancing it open on the palm of his hand, threatened to pin the doctor to the wall. The doctor never so much as moved. He spoke to him as before, over his shoulder, and in the same tone of voice, rather high, so that all the room might hear, but perfectly calm and steady. If you do not put that knife this instant in your pocket, I promise, upon my honor, you shall hang at the next assizes. Then followed a battle of looks between them, but the captain soon knuckled under, put up his weapon, and resumed his seat, grumbling like a beaten dog. There are some positive adjectives that color the way the reader might think of the doctor, but it's his actions that really shape who he is in the reader's mind. He's courageous, calm, self-assured, and cool under pressure. The reader learns all this from the way the doctor manages this encounter with this very dirty scoundrel. This is a character being characterized through his interaction with another character. 
In this case, Stevenson laid the groundwork for this characterization by spending much of the chapter meticulously crafting the reader's impression of the pirate, but the doctor? We know everything we need to know about him after he stares down the captain and doesn't blink. Characters characterize characters. So there you have it. That's the spectrum of knowledge a narrator can present concerning their characters. Knowledge can be explicit, either a concrete or abstract description, and knowledge can be implicit, characterization through the character's behavior, the character's interactions with their environment, and the character's interactions with others. All these aspects of characterization shape the reader's impression of them. Great characters come in all shapes and sizes, with personalities representing a spectrum as diverse as humanity itself. Crafting great characters demands attention to these details. But above all, characters must be set in motion. Most of what readers come to appreciate about characters is learned through how they act. The question before us now is whether your character is an active or passive participant in their story. You may be familiar with the term agency as it relates to literary matters. This is more or less the question here. Does your character have agency and why she should have agency in some cases while maybe not in others? This depends, of course, on the story you're telling and what role your character has in it. This lesson doesn't so much take a position on whether your character should have agency or how much, but rather serves as a guide to help you grapple with these questions fruitfully. So let's get to it. The first order of business is to get a clear picture of what participation means in a narrative sense. There's a difference between, let's say, Mel Gibson screaming until his painted blue face turns actual blue underneath, prompting him to charge across a battlefield and crush some English skulls with the Wallace sword, and, oh, I don't know, that fat, lovable cat, Garfield, sitting in his box all day, dreaming of lasagna. Both seem to be successful stories that people enjoy on some level. We'll look at the extremely active and the extremely passive characters, why they might succeed in some situations and not in others, and touch the important bases in between. And, because I like the occasional spectrum, I'm going to present one here. At the active end, the agent. The most active characters in the story are the agents. The word agent comes from the Latin verb agere, which literally means to do. Agents are the doers of the story world. The agent takes charge and acts, usually in their own interest, and it is their will that drives the story forward. The effector, one step down from the agent is the effector. You could think of this character as the shot caller, the one who affects change in the story world. Think Don Corleone in The Godfather. Don Vito doesn't pull the trigger, but he tells the man who does who to whack and when to do it. Presidents, CEOs, generals, and bosses, they change the story world through the use of sub-agents who do their bidding for them. The undergoer. This is a character who, not so shockingly, undergoes something. Well, what the hell does that mean? You could think of this character as one who sets out into the story world with a purpose. Often this character is on a quest of some kind. Think Alice and her adventures in Wonderland. The undergoer has some agency in that she has the choice to move forward, but what happens to her along the way is not always in her control. She could be attacked by an oversized deck of playing cards or befriended by a smiling Cheshire cat. You have to keep undergoing to find out. The experiencer. The experiencer is still slightly more passive. They are a participant in the story, but not an actor. The only agency is the choice to participate. It's kind of like hopping in a roller coaster, getting strapped down and going along for the ride, experiencing all the twists and turns along the way. You become an experiencer each time you buy a movie ticket. You surrender your agency for a couple hours in exchange for a good story. Well, we hope. Patient. The patient is the character devoid of agency. 
The term patient comes from the Latin patiens, an adjective meaning suffering or enduring. The patient has action done to him with little or no recourse as to when it will happen or stop. This is a pretty boring role if the agent in this story is a conscientious and loving caregiver. But if the agent is a psychopath, being a patient is fun, for the reader that is. Okay, so that's a five-part tour of the range from Dewar to Dundid 2. What of it? Well, we started with the premise that characters can be interesting along all parts of this spectrum. But curiously enough, if we follow good characters through their stories, we'll usually find that they don't stay in one place on this spectrum throughout their entire story. To understand why this is, we're going to explore a funny little concept called genre. Like all categorizations, the borders of genres are porous, and the borders of genres are cognitively constructed in the same way as any categorization. We group similar stories with other stories, we form a concept of the ideal story for the genre category, and we have theories about what makes a story fall into each genre category. In the end, we get categories like sci-fi, mystery, thriller, romance, detective, etc. You may have noticed that I entirely omitted genre from my discussion of plot. This is because you will find all the magnetic plot elements in all the genres. You will find sex in sci-fi as surely as in romance, betrayal and revenge in mysteries, and mysterious elements in epics, and violence, sex, and danger in comedies. Plot is not genre, and genre is not plot. Genre is a means of categorizing stories, usually for the purposes of marketing, but it also serves as a handy tool to connect readers and writers with the kinds of stories they want to write and read. Genre also informs quite a bit on how active or passive characters tend to be in successful stories, and usefully when. In a detective story, for example, the mystery presents itself in a character or a pair of characters are called to hash out the details of the case, whether it be a murder, a disappearance, a robbery, or the like. The detective begins with little knowledge and not much agency. They may play the role of effector by way of saying things like, get these fingerprints to the lab for analysis, or close off that area and get me the surveillance footage. But mostly they're an undergoer, and often an experiencer. They look, they observe, they gather information, they wait. As the story progresses, though, they must begin to put the clues together. Usually, this requires them to track down leads in the form of people who know something about the case. They have to find ways to make these people talk to them, even when they're reluctant. They may threaten, make deals, rough a few people up. They may become effectors and often agents. In the end, you'd probably be disappointed if they didn't go into at least one dark building with their gun drawn in anticipation of their dangerous suspect hiding inside, waiting to get the drop on them. The pattern is similar in horror stories, though more pronounced. This genre is so well defined that many horror films make fun of the commonest conventions while still not straying from those very conventions. It's usually a virginal girl or a virginal girl and her young attractive friends. Their safety is threatened, either by circumstance, stumbling into unknown territory, or by a stranger who ventures into and threatens their previously safe territory. She, or they, begin the story as patients, waiting for the menacing agents to attack, unsure when such incursions will come. These are the initial suspense cues, often accompanied by screams and jumps, and the story is expected to surprise the reader or viewer with the timing of these incursions. Gradually, through experience, the newly unsafe territory becomes slightly more familiar. The patients might figure out a pattern in who or what is attacking them. They form plans that either partially succeed or fail in instructive ways. They move from patients to agents, fail, find themselves as patients again, but continue to undergo out of necessity. Eventually, the hunted become desperate enough and daring enough to challenge their attackers directly. The patients become agents of their own fate, at least in theory. Usually someone gets away, but never without scars, physical or emotional, and never without the prospect of some unknown menacing force rising up again in a similar manner. Sound familiar? So how is this useful? Consider it a framework for thinking about how your characters should act. In a literary story, the answer will probably not be so clearly defined. 
but you might consider whether some movement is necessary along the spectrum from agent to patient. The answer is usually yes if you'd like your reader to enjoy your story. Often, when people speak of a character developing an arc or growing, movement along this spectrum is what they're talking about. A character finally deciding to take action is a suspenseful change in its own right, leaving the reader with the question of whether it will work out well or ill for a protagonist. Additionally, agency coupled with genre considerations can be a useful framework for gathering information about stories you may like to imitate or draw from, who is doing what when, and who is having things done to them. The stories of the perpetrator and the victim can be equally compelling depending on how events shape their outlook. The victim might grow by learning how to heal or defend himself. The perpetrator may grow by taking action to make amends or by suffering just retribution. Agency or patency are neither necessarily good nor bad, nor are they merely academic concepts pretentious undergrads throw into term papers to impress their professors. This is simply a way of considering what characters are doing and why. And it's worth considering for your characters. How your characters act is most of what shapes your reader's impression of your characters. I'm going to hammer this point home again in this lesson. In a superficial way, we covered how characters' actions implicitly shape that impression. Think Lawrence putting out matches with his fingers. And we did say a few words about what such an action might say about Lawrence. Interpreting human actions in the world is an incredibly complex task. Lawrence and the match is tricky. Does it endear him to you? Do you identify with him when he does it? Does it make you think he's a jerk? Or maybe it doesn't really make you think at all, except that it's a cheeky trick to goad unsuspecting corporals into setting him up to drop a badass line. The trick, my dear Roe, is not minding that it hurts. How we interpret characters' actions can shape whether we empathize with them or we absolutely hate their guts. Not all actions are as tricky to interpret as Lawrence and his match. This lesson is dedicated to the easy things, actions that are sure to cue your readers to feel a certain way about certain characters. Here's what I mean. Take Tom Buchanan from The Great Gatsby, for example. F. Scott Fitzgerald first introduces him descriptively through Nick Carraway's narration. A straw-haired man of 30, with a rather hard mouth and supercilious manner, Two shining, arrogant eyes had established dominance over his face and gave him the appearance of always leaning aggressively forward. His speaking voice, a gruff, husky tenor, added to the impression of fractiousness he conveyed. There was a touch of paternal contempt in it, even toward the people he liked. And there were men at New Haven who had hated his guts. Such a passage reminds me of a question Doc Holliday asks his paramour in the film Tombstone regarding Johnny Ringo. What do you think, darling? Should I hate him? Yes, reader, you should hate him. And if that wasn't obvious enough for you, he's portrayed in the following scene as rude, dismissive, and condescending to his wife and Nick, and in case you hadn't gotten the hint after that, Fitzgerald makes sure you know it by making him a literal champion of white supremacy five pages later. Even by 1920 standards, Tom Buchanan is leading off in the all-star game of total assholes. And that's before he slaps his mistress in the face so hard he breaks her nose. There's not a lot of gray area here if you're not a psychopath. A character like Tom Buchanan is designed to be loathed. If that was Fitzgerald's goal, then he succeeded by any measure. So how can you get your reader to hate a character if you want to? Have him kick a dog for starters. I'm serious. I know this lesson may seem a bit cynical, like there should be some more artistic means to achieve such an end. Well, I'm sorry, but no, that is the art. If you want your reader to hate your character, he's going to need to kick that dog. And for good measure, make it a hungry dog with three legs and sad eyes. 
have the poor dog yelp and whimper as she hobbles away. Now I'm sad. And yes, I hate me too. Now you're the asshole, Ro. Okay, let's take a step back before some overzealous fictional animal rights activist comes after me for fictional animal abuse. What exactly am I going on about? By the time I'd reread Gatsby a couple of years ago, I'd been tracking clearly defined actions that color the impression of characters in the way I'm talking about here. I call these occurrences empathy markers. And once I point them out to you, you're going to see them all the time in stories. They either make characters endearing or vile depending on whether they're positive or negative markers. And I'd compiled a solid list of negative ones by the time I became reacquainted with Tom Buchanan. So he jumped out at me as the most conspicuously marked character I can recall in American literature. He's just way too easy to hate. He checked about every box on my list in a span of 20 pages. So let's examine those bad guy boxes, and then we'll look at how to make your readers have positive vibes towards your characters. Some of the negative empathy markers. Arrogance, bullying, deceit, unwarranted violence, racism, sexism, any ism, rudeness, cowardice, callousness, overblown negative reactions, hatred, or cruelty. If any of these negative empathy markers have direct victims like bullying, isms, and unwarranted violence, then the more helpless the victim, the more negatively the character will be marked. Toss in a menacing laugh and you'll have Tom Buchanan, comic book style. We'll talk about how to complicate this too, both here and in the next lesson when we talk about flat and round characters. It may very well be your goal to create characters as one-dimensional as Tom Buchanan, they often work very well and serve a useful purpose in a story, and turn out to be very memorable. Hey McFly! But if you're not striving to fill your stories with Tom Buchanan's and Biff Tannen's, you're going to have to build some layers into them. Alternatively, you may just want to go in the other direction. The angels, the good guys, the characters who make us feel all warm and fuzzy. Or they often make us feel pity so that we start rooting for them. I was recently watching one of the new Planet of the Apes movies, and there's a scene where the apes are running around the mountains in the dead of winter with this little blonde human girl who is completely defenseless and cute. And the biggest, baddest, meanest looking gorilla walks up to her, and of course, she's terrified. And this gorilla picks a pink blossom from a tree, never mind what the tree was doing blossoming in the middle of winter, and he places it delicately in her pretty blonde hair. Aww. I knew that gorilla was toast. He'd been marked as the sympathetic tough guy, and predictably he bit it in the next battle. And even though I saw it coming from a mile away, I still felt sad for the big lug. As humans, social animals that we are, this kind of empathy is deeply embedded in our psyche. People can't just switch it off. So a simple action of kindness or courage can similarly mark your characters as the ones to root for while they are still kicking and the ones to mourn when they're gone. Here are some positive empathy markers. Compassion toward animals or other vulnerable figures. Fighting for the defenseless, love of the downtrodden, loneliness, innocence, vulnerability, unrequited love, teasing a lover, courage in the face of overwhelming odds, determination, generosity, self-sacrifice. Again, this might seem cynical or even overly simplistic, but you will see these empathy markers over and over again across the entire range of fictional stories from summer blockbusters to timeless literary classics. Here's poor, friendless Jane Eyre, recounting the shame of being singled out for punishment as she arrived at her school for poor, unwanted little orphan girls. There was I, then, mounted aloft, I, who had said I could not bear the shame of standing on my natural feet in the middle of the room, was now exposed to a general view on a pedestal of infamy. What my sensations were, no language can describe, but as they all rose, stifling my breath and constricting my throat, a girl came up and passed me. In passing, she lifted her eyes. What a strange light inspired them! What an extraordinary sensation that ray sent through me! How the new feeling bore me up! It was as if a martyr, a hero, had passed a slave or victim and imparted strength in the transit. I mastered the rising hysteria, lifted up my head, and took a firm stand on the stool. 
Helen Burns asked some slight question about her work of Miss Smith, was chidden for the triviality of the inquiry, returned her place, and smiled at me as she again went by. What a smile! I remember it now, and I know it was the effluence of fine intellect, of true courage. It lit up her marked lineaments, her thin face, her sunken gray eyes, like a reflection from the aspect of an angel. How virtuous and brave little Helen is to comfort the scorned. A new friend for Jane. I have to stay on that side of the pond and channel Monty Python's mafia caricatures. It would be a real shame if something bad were to happen to little Helen now, wouldn't it? We wouldn't want that. Surprised that a literary master like Bronte would manipulate her reader's emotions so cynically? Don't be. Again, this is the art. If you want to make your readers laugh with or cry for your good guys, they've got to be marked out as good guys. An act of kindness in a time of need or even a tiny glint of compassion from the toughest hombre in the Pueblo will let your reader know there's something there worth caring about. That's the nuts and bolts of empathy markers. But I have a bit more to say about the application of them. Just as there are total jerks and superlative people in the world, there are one-dimensional characters in fiction. This applies to popular fiction as much as to great literature. Jane's friend Helen and Tom Buchanan are merely two examples of one-dimensional characters in great literary works. But you'll notice, I'm sure, that Helen and Tom aren't the main characters in those stories. Empathy markers are tools that help direct your reader's empathy, but they can be poorly or overly applied quite easily. Over-application of positive empathy markers can make for a boring or uninteresting character. Remember that suspense is what keeps your reader engaged, and if your reader already knows that your character is going to do the right thing without any equivocation, then they won't stay interested for very long. This is a similar phenomenon to a Mary Sue type character. A Mary Sue is a derogatory term for characters who are improbably good at everything. This terminology is supposed to have derived from Star Trek fan fiction in the 60s and 70s. Bad fan fiction, mind you where the ship would be in grave peril and Ensign Mary Sue would inevitably save the day without breaking a sweat. Engine trouble? It's so bad that even Scotty can't fix it. Well, let Mary Sue take a crack at it, and what do you know, Captain? The engines are back online. A boarding party of 15 Klingon warriors? Send Mary Sue down there, Captain. She knows Kung Fu. She'll kick their asses. She's also the best pilot, speaks 52 different languages, negotiates diplomatic treaties, and is very, very kind to animals. She's also insufferable. This, by the way, is also the reason it's so hard to make a good Superman movie. If you don't have a mountain of kryptonite to throw at him, good luck generating any reasonable amount of suspense. So, use discretion in marking your characters good. The same can be said of cartoonishly evil villains. Emperor Nero may have looked supremely awful playing his lyre while Rome burned to the ground, but he probably seemed like a decent guy playing his lyre on a warm spring day in the garden. Even the worst psychopaths have a touch of humanity in them. Far more satisfying than Mary Sue's are the Han Solos of the fictional world. When the audience first meets Han, he's cocky, arrogant, selfish, and greedy. He has one motivation, money, and short of that, Han's not lifting a finger for you. But that's only because he doesn't know you yet. He'd take a blaster bolt to the heart for Chewbacca in a second. The more the audience gets to know the guy, the more it becomes obvious that there's a decent person underneath his cocky exterior. He's loyal, courageous, and when it comes down to it, he will put his ass on the line for his friends at the moments it counts most. This is the flawed hero, and flawed heroes are far more satisfying than Mary Sue's. There's suspense embedded in the question of whether they can overcome their demons to do what needs to be done. They're vulnerable, and there's a reasonable chance they'll let you down. We expect the righteous, virtuous, and brave to come through, but the flawed hero defies our expectations in the most satisfying way. You didn't know that they had it in them. Similarly, seeing a virtuous hero failing to overcome their fears or demons can shock and satisfy in the opposite way. So use your empathy markers judiciously and wisely. Make that grumpy old man pick up a stray kitten, and give that vicious politician a soft spot for his cute little niece. 
This lesson may seem a cynical and superficial way to talk about evoking genuine emotion in your readers, but it does serve the purpose. The topic is, of course, far more complex than this superficial discussion can show. However, the discussion needs to be superficial in order to elucidate the concept reductively. But the general idea holds true in both popular genre fiction and in the most literary works. I haven't said much about the difference between genre fiction and literary fiction, so here's as good a place as any. Like all categories, the border between the literary and the popular is not a hard line. This is a damn porous border if you ask me. There are obvious examples of extremely literary works that adopt the conventions of a genre, and there are certainly works of quote-unquote genre fiction that have the quality of literariness about them. There have, in fact, been court cases that attempted to hash out similar questions as a consequence of various censorious government entities attempting to ban books and films they deemed obscene. Perhaps one of the most famous First Amendment cases in American judicial history hinged on the question of defining obscenity as opposed to art. Jacobellus v. Ohio in 1964 concerned the rights of a movie theater owner to show a film deemed obscene by the state of Ohio. In the Supreme Court's ruling, which exonerated Mr. Jacobellus, Justice Potter Stewart wrote one of the more widely circulated opinions ever offered on pornography. He wrote, I shall not today attempt to further define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description, pornography, and perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so, but I know it when I see it, and the motion picture involved in this case is not that. Stewart's decision came four years after another famous literary censorship case was brought and tried in England, following the passage of Britain's Obscene Publications Act of 1959. In 1960, prosecutors took Penguin Books to trial for publishing D. H. Lawrence's steamy novel, Lady Chatterley's Lover. At the trial, literary heavyweights Raymond Williams, Dame Helen Gardner, and E. M. Forster were all called to testify about what constituted literary value or merit. None could define literary merit much better than Justice Stewart. I know it when I see it. Now, I'd like to believe I could do a little better than what came to be known as the eye test. But here we are again wrestling with the problem of defining categories and the porousness of their borders. I tend to think that our definition of stories can help in this regard. I think it lies in the difference between entertains and instructs or explores the nature of the human condition. A good example of this would be a genre romance, where the selling point and the very purpose of the book is to provide the reader situations portraying steamy simulations of sex. This is entertainment, and still meets with our definition of good fiction when it's entertaining in the way it intends. But there are also many literary works whose primary plot element is also sex, whether it's a love affair, a budding romance, or even a memorable one-night stand that makes a character question everything they thought they knew about love. The difference, as I see it, is what makes these stories literary and not genre fiction is that the story isn't about the sex itself in the way a genre romance is. It is far more concerned with the deeper emotions and baggage that go along with the sex portrayed in the story. In other words, it's exploring the nature of the human condition through sex. The sex isn't really the point. The same could be said with a popular action or thriller story, and a literary story filled with intense action sequences. I think that's part of the story. Also, perhaps one of the elements that is most conspicuously absent from modern literary fiction is the presence of pure heroes and villains. This also pertains to our next lesson as well, but I offer it here to put a cap on our discussion of empathy markers. Literary characters don't generally play a clearly defined hero or villain role. Their stories are far more complex. They usually bear markers from both the good and the bad pile. Heroic dog kickers, you might say. Or perhaps villainous dog lovers would be a friendlier way of framing it. And sometimes main characters might not be marked at all. In any case, I offer these empathy markers as a framework for thinking about how you'd like your readers to perceive your characters. Add to your own list whenever you see a good marker in a story, and then use it wisely. Why, you'll turn out like the Mary Sue of writers, or Superman, or something.
What discussion of characters would be complete without at least some mention of E.M. Forster's distinction between flat and round characters? Not ours, anyway. This is ground that's been well covered by, like, every introductory textbook, craft guide, fiction writing class, and probably most college-level literature classes to some degree. So what can we say about it that hasn't been said already? A few useful things, I hope. So even if it's familiar, I'm going to take a crack at it with the hopes of putting a new spin on the topic for the initiated. And for those of you who may not know what the hell I'm talking about, or even who E.M. Forster is, flatness and roundness of characters is perhaps the most common way literary folks talk about characters. So what does it mean? Well, E.M. Forster was a very highly regarded British novelist of the early 20th century. And like almost every highly regarded novelist of any era, Forster had a few thoughts about the art of writing fiction, which he shared in a series of lectures at Trinity College, Cambridge, in 1927. Also, Forster did as novelists do, and wrote down said thoughts into a book titled Aspects of the Novel, which sold many copies. This was one of the early craft guides on which many subsequent fiction writing guides are based. It's a quick and useful read if you're interested, but by no means is it critical reading if you're not. Anyway, perhaps the most enduring concept Forster shared in these lectures is the distinction between flat and round characters. So how did he discuss these categories and why? Forster believed that one could sort literary characters into the flat and round piles, essentially. Jane Eyre, round. Tom Buchanan, flat. What did Forster mean by this exactly? You might think of a flat character as a type, or even a caricature. One might sum up flat characters, as Forster expresses them, as a character who can be described in one sentence. For example, Tom Buchanan is an all-around awful guy and entitled bully. That pretty much covers Tom. Though it's usually the instinct of critics, scholars, and lay people alike to brush aside flat characters as less desirable, Forster, quite correctly in my view, takes a nuanced approach to flat characters. He wrote, A novel that is at all complex often requires flat people as well as round, and the outcome of their collisions parallels life. Forster points out several advantages of flat characters, that they're easily recognized and remembered, perform clearly delineated roles, and seldom confuse the reader by doing unpredictable things. Sometimes they're an important character, like a beloved teacher or guide on a journey, like Mr. Miyagi or Gandalf. And sometimes their function is their title, like Glinda the Good Witch or the Wicked Witch of the West. Flat characters are very often necessary parts of the world that need to exist for the story worlds of deeper, rounder characters to seem as real or as vivid as they do. So what is a round character, then? A round character, as Forster puts it, has the incalculability of life about it, life within the pages of a book. They're larger literary accomplishments, according to Forster. They give the impression of real, fully fleshed out people, and they have the power to move readers, as Forster puts it, to feelings beyond mere humor or appropriateness. With a round character, in concert with other characters, flat or otherwise, Forster states, the novel achieves the task of acclimatization and harmonizes the human race with the other aspects of his work. To my ears, this sounds an awful lot like the second part of our definition of what fiction should do. Instructs and explores the nature of the human condition. Again, we seem to be reaching the same distinction we grappled with regarding popular versus literary fiction. Forster gave a theory for determining whether a character is round. He states, it is capable of surprising in a convincing way. If it never surprises, it is flat. If it does not convince, it is a flat pretending to be round. Thus, for Forster, roundness hinged on two things, the ability to surprise and the ability to do so convincingly. This may be a good place to start, and perhaps it describes many round characters, but I think we'd be better off looking deeper than surprise as our barometer. For starters, a flat character should be just as convincing as a round character. That's a given. An unconvincing character isn't a character but an author's mistake. However, I could draw up a long list of round characters whose actions don't particularly surprise, but through the sheer verisimilitude of their narratives, they convince me of their roundness because 
experiencing their story forces me to explore humanity, the deeper things that touch the shared tragedy and beauty of living a life. I'm not sure there's a heuristic for this in the way Forster proposes, certainly not a test as simple as his, but I think if writers aspire beyond the very difficult minimum of good fiction, that it must at least entertain, then they should probably aspire to write at least one round character into their stories, and sometimes more. This is certainly one of the more difficult and vague targets to hit as fiction writers. Hopefully, through this survey of character attributes, you'll have the tools at hand to at least take aim. In addition to the topics we've covered in this section, I'd also refer you back to the plot lesson on dilemma and conflict, and the exercise in the accompanying book pertaining. Understanding your character's inner worlds is an invaluable guidepost in creating convincing and, dare I say it, even round characters. Starting with the sense for their depth of knowledge, their obligations, their wishes, as well as their past history, personality, quirks, and flaws, all these things will help to start an author with a sense for who their character is. These things will give the writer the feeling of a complete person, for if you as the writer don't sense a fully realized person in your story, I think you'll be hard-pressed to convince your reader of the same. In any case, lofty as the target may be, all writers have roughly the same tools for building characters. Description, both abstract and concrete. Character actions and dialogue. How those actions implicitly characterize through behavior, environment, and in relation to other characters. The character's role, whether agent or patient, and how it changes over the course of the story. And how the character's actions mark them as some shade of good or bad in the reader's mind. All those choices are going to add up to the sum of your characters, which, if you do a great job, may result in a discussion among book nerds or students somewhere as to whether your character is flat or round. And if that ever happens, regardless of the verdict, you've done your job. If people care enough about your characters to think about them and talk about them, well done, you've made it. You're writing something real. Here's hoping. Now we've talked about plot, narration, and characters. It's high time we said a few words about that dynamic story world, the spaces and places your characters inhabit. Buckle up, my intrepid fellow writers. There's a story world out there, and we're going in. <laughs>